Let's pray. Ask God to bless His Word. Father God, we know that Your Word, it will accomplish that for which You send it. And today, God, by the power of Your Word, may You open up our hearts. Those of us that need a word of encouragement would hear that Word. Those of us that need a word of rebuke would hear that Word. Those of us that need fixing of relationships or finances or health or whatever it is, God, we just lay our lives right down upon Your Word. Do what You want and how You want. We surrender fully to You. Um, We proclaim to you that we have no place else to go, for you have the words of life. And we want to have a situation happen like like happened at the road of Emmaus, that our heart will burn within us, God. Speak words of life to us, God. Your servants are listening. We are your sheep, gladly, gladly listening for your voice. In Christ's name, amen. 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 If you um, were here last week and you remember, we looked at... um, The end times, we talked about a lot of eschatology and what's going to happen in the end. And and the last thing the Lord said on that sermon was, watch, watch. And he shut the mouths of all those that would come against him. He made the worldly logic foolishness. And two days have passed by. And they plotted how they might solve this problem. And they came up with the conclusion in verse 1, in chapter 14, that says, After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they may take him by trickery and put him to death. Please give me your attention. Verse 1. If you go back to Mark chapter 3, guys, you might remember, he healed the man with the withered hand, and so angered, so frustrated, so did they have a word of prophecy from there. God, the enemy himself, they said, you know, I hate this guy, and we should kill him now. All the way back, two and a half plus years before this, they wanted to put him to death already, and now they better do something, and they better do something fast, because they're about to watch, they're about to watch their money flow come down. Now, scholars would suggest, I want you to know, that they say that there was about 13 people in all possible that could have wanted him dead. That 13 people with big mouth, 13 people with big influence are wrecking the whole plan for this nation, for the nation of Israel. That there was a whole nation and the vast majority wanted the plan of God. They were doing the best they can, but yet just 13 people were messing it up. Now I want you to know it was the Passover feast and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Also, it was called the, the Feast of the uh, First Fruits. There was three Jewish feasts going on right now. Now, if you're new to Scripture, if you're new especially to Old Testament things, let me explain to you what the Passover was. The Israelites, started by Abraham, his son Isaac, and then Jacob's 12 sons, experienced... And you could read this stuff in the book of uh, um, Genesis for your, your, your own benefit... They, they, uh, they experienced a, um, a famine in the land. And through Joseph, the youngest son, you guys remember Joseph, the coat of many colors and all that story from, from your uh, Sunday school days? He was taken as a slave and then winds up as the, um, as the second in command in all Egypt. You guys are with me, right? All of Israel comes into the land now. Seventy people, they come into Egypt And that's where they make their stand. But when Pharaoh dies and a new Pharaoh comes in and he didn't have any respect for Joseph or who Joseph was, they put the Jews in bondage. The Jews are slaves for some 400 years. And that's when Moses arises and Moses says, man, let my people go. And and he puts the plagues on Israel. You guys are still with me, right? Understanding what I'm saying. This is good information, knowledge to have. And they started this thing called the Passover. God said to Moses... I want you to tell Pharaoh that the last plague upon the land will be proclaimed by Pharaoh himself, the death of the firstborn of all who don't have the blood of the lamb upon their door. So I want you to take a lamb, a little ewe lamb, and I want you to take it into your house. And for a month, I want you to care for it and take... How many of you guys have ever gone to a petting zoo and seen the little cute lambs and rams and goats? Is there anything cuter than that? I mean, you want to talk about having your kids fall in love with those giant eyes and those cool things because they got eyebrows. 
and they got these big round eyes. It's just, it's impossible not to fall in love with them. He says, after these 30 days are over, you know what I want you to do? I want you to kill it. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to take the thing in the house, love it for 30 days, and then kill it? Yeah, you have to, you have to learn heartbreak when you're, when you're going to be really a believer of God. That doesn't make any sense. Well, in about 2,000 years it will. You understand what I'm saying? They don't know what they were doing. They only knew what God had told them to do. And through obedience, they take the lamb, they bring it in the house. And now here's the crazy thing. Now I want you to picture a door, right? Here's a door. It's a big rectangle. He says, I want you to kill the lamb. I want you to take the blood, and I want you to put one on the doorposts and the lentils, the top of the door and the sides of the door. Now, I don't know what picture he might have been making some thousands of years earlier. I don't know. Nothing comes to mind. (laughs) But the prophecy of what was going on then to speak to us is clear. Isn't it, guys? So they had this thing they called the Passover feast. And now they were going to celebrate the Passover, but unlike what should have been, Celebrating Passover became kind of a cultural thing. It's when all the Jews went to Jerusalem. There's a couple of million people there, and we just have a big party and a big feast. I don't know how you grew up, but the way I grew up, Christmas and Easter, Passover, Pesach, uh, Yom Kippur, all these feasts that we did, they were just excuses for the family to get together, and they were nice. There's nothing wrong with them. But they had lost completely the meaning for which they were set forth to be. Anybody grow up knowing what I'm talking about? Yeah, we, we did that. You know, we had Christmas was great. They made hash brownies and everybody got stoned. And I'm talking about my parents. I was a child of the 60s, I'm sorry. Now, proof of that is, although these, these scribes and Pharisees are celebrating the Passover, they spent their Passover... The lamb, the blood that was spread on the doorpost and on the lentil, the angel of God, the angel of death literally, would go through Jerusalem, would, I'm sorry, would go through Egypt and would see where the blood of the lamb was on what door and it would pass over. You with me? Now what a picture. If you don't have the blood of the lamb sprinkled on your heart... Death will not pass you by. You will die. If that's not expediently politically correct, if that doesn't make proper religious sense to you guys, I'm sorry. Here's what I decided long ago. I decided that anybody that comes to this church, one of three things were going to happen. Number one, they knew they were going to heaven. Number two, they knew they were going to hell. Or number three, they ran fast because they didn't want to hear the truth. That was the only decisions. There was no others. I would have nobody sitting here, I would have nobody sitting here not knowing where they stood. I want everybody to know where they stand. And unless the blood of Christ Jesus enters your heart through a profession of faith, you are destined and doomed to go to hell. That's it. If that's not for us, if that's not for you, you came to the wrong place. Continuing. So it's the Passover. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it's the Feast of First Fruits. They celebrated all three of those at the same time, going back all the way 2,000 and some odd years ago. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, they said, you know, we better kill this guy. Wait a second, we're supposed to be celebrating the uh, Passover. Yeah, but we better kill this guy, because otherwise the rest of our Passover is going to be miserable, and I don't want him to ruin our Passover. Verse 2, but they said... Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And now, again, a little bit of background. The Romans, during the time of the Passover feast, in Jerusalem, when there was a couple of million people there, they had one job. Keep the peace. The leader of the land, who was Roman, in Rome, was Caesar. He had his procurator, whatever that word was. His name was Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was told, one more uproar, and now it's your butt. So that's all they wanted. Keep the peace during the feast. 
Verse 3, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Please, again, let me explain. This is what we do. We go word by word, line by line, and we explain and talk about the Bible. There is this woman, and we know through the book of John, because the funny thing is this very story is explained in three of the Gospels. In the book of John, it clearly states that this is the same Mary whose sister was Martha, whose brother was Lazarus. This is not Mary Magdalene. This is not what the Bible calls the other Mary. This is, this is the woman, and all three times she's recorded in Scripture. You know where she is? At the feet of Jesus. Interesting about this woman. Now, what she did is, she comes in. Now, this is not the woman, guys, who went into the house of Simon the Tanner, who washed the Lord's feet with her tears. This is not that woman. This is not. Some say that was Mary Magdalene, although that's just speculation as well. This is Mary, who's whose brother was raised from the dead, who also, going back to uh, the book of John, the Pharisees wanted him dead too. They knew, hey listen, this guy was raised from the dead, he's got to die because people are coming to find out what that's all about. However, now you have a background of that. She comes in and she has this, this box, this flask of oil of spikenard. Now, does anybody know what spikenard is for? It's for dead bodies. What they do is they anoint dead bodies and it kind of preserves them. It helps them kind of mummify, so to speak. She took it, she broke it, she poured it on his head, and there were some who were indignant among themselves, said, why was this fragrant or wasted? Verse 6, Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For the poor you have with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Please give me your attention. Let me give you an application. Sometimes guys just don't get it. The men... (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Sometimes... Us guys, when we see this thing happening in our lives that we want to go with, we have this ability to ignore what God really wants us to do. God said, listen, things ain't going to keep going the way they are. There's troubled times are coming. And I'm going to go into Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be killed, but I will rise the third day. Keep that in mind. It was this sister, this precious daughter of the king, who said, he's going to die. I better prepare him. So she brings this jar, and some say, some scholars would suggest that might be her dowry, because they said it was worth 300 denarii. Now, if you guys don't know what a dowry is, back in the day when you married a woman, you were a man of prominence, you would find a woman also who had a similar prominence. And what would happen was, the more wealthy they were, the more you desired them. And when you would marry them, what was held back as their dowry was what you would get when you married them was their riches, their father's riches, their family's riches. Now, who would marry a poor man if you were a rich girl? And who would marry a rich girl if you were a poor? Obviously, you understand the situation. So, What chance back then did this poor single woman have of finding a good man? She didn't care. You know what she cared about? She cared about that her whole life was wrapped up in the Lord Jesus. And what a picture for you sisters here. What an amazing opportunity for a witness. For you young sisters here, I want to say some of you guys that are in your late 20s, maybe even early 30s, you're looking at your lives and you're thinking to yourself, I've made something in my life. I have a job. I have a house. I have an apartment. I have a lot to offer a man. Why am I still alone? You ask yourself, I'm educated. I'm smart. I'm good looking. Why am I still alone? 
And now, as I've said before, instead of looking for God's Mr. Right, you're looking for your Mr. Right now. And you take for yourselves this woman Mary. Everywhere anybody goes that this gospel is preached, everybody talks about Mary. What was Mary's, what was Mary's great deed? What, what did she do? She didn't, she didn't cast out demons. She didn't, what, what did Mary do that made her so special? She just gave God her whole heart. She just trusted that God would take care of her through thick and thin. It was great faith that Mary had. And I want to encourage the sisters in here, please don't worry. Don't go to some church that they have a singles ministry because you think that um, that's where you're going to find the guy that God has for you. Don't go to your, um, don't go to your friends at the club looking for what will not satisfy. I promise you, ladies, God's going to take care of you. He loves his sisters. You notice that in the Bible, God wrestles with his sons, but he doesn't wrestle with his daughters. He takes care, gentle and wonderful care of his daughters. And he will do that for you. Please use this as an encouragement. Then Judas Iscariot, verse 10, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he saw it how he might conveniently betray him. You guys know Judas Iscariot. He's the one that betrayed the Lord. Obviously, this is where it started. Verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. Now, again, a little bit of the background. The man carrying the jug was the whole thing because that was a woman's work back then. So he said, I want you to find a guy that's carrying a jug. Easy to spot because only, only chicks do that. So they go into the city. They see the guy and they ask for his upper room. Now, why does Mark describe it like that? Some scholars suggest, and there's more than just a little bit of history on this, that the upper room that they actually met in was Mark's family's house. Mark was a very wealthy kid. His family had a lot of stuff, and they met, and the actual last supper happened up in their upper room. Are you guys with me? Good. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and said to him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be good for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they, drank, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Please give me your attention before we finish. The understanding of how we pray for food and the understanding of when we do a communion has always been one of those things that there's definitely some weird thing. We did communion last week, and there's always some weird thing. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if, if somebody from the world comes in, and there you got your little cup and your little bread, it kind of looks like weird. Like, what are you guys doing? Nothing. But here, the picture of how they did communion, the picture of how they did, um, about how they did praying for food. Like sometimes you go out with people, you go out to eat with people, and especially as a pastor, they, they don't know when you're going to pray or how you're going to pray, and you always see the apprehension on them, and I, I love that. I, I use that to the end. <laughs> so they sit in there, and they get the bread, and they, wait, they look at you, and they're like, are you going to eat or am I going to eat? Are you going to pray for the food? Is he going to pray for the food? I don't know. you pray for the food? We, me and my family, we usually pray when we get the main course. 
So we eat our bread, we eat our salad. I mean, we've already just slamming the food down. We're kind of hungry prayer people, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's eat. Let me build up some strength before this prayer. <laughs> and especially if one of my daughters, my little daughters, pray, I don't know where they get it from, but they pray like a really long time. <laughs> and then they start mumbling, so you really can't hear them, and you're really just listening for the amen. <laughs> and usually... If we have company there, they're, they're holding food in their hand. Wait. <laughs> the Lord with his disciples. See, they're eating. They're in the middle of eating. And in the middle of eating, he gets up and he gives thanks. So you know what? Guys, let's thank God for this food. And they start to give thanks. And then he breaks the bread and he goes, here, you know what? Let's have a communion right now. Guys, lift up a piece of bread. Right there in the middle of the meal, which kind of makes sense, because when you think about it, if you go back to 1 Corinthians, he talks about it. He goes, well, you all get together. He says, everybody's, you, you're not getting there to have communion. You're getting there to eat. Man, eat at home. You don't have to. So now it starts to make sense. Right there in the middle of the meal. Now, dads that are in here, leaders of houses, man, what a great idea. Is this the only place that you do communion here when we got your little, you got your little cup? You got your little, our little bread. How about at home? How about you guys decide from now on, once a month, you guys are going to have... When I grew up, and everybody hears this, when I grew up, um, I lived in a neighborhood where the streetlights went on about 6 o'clock, depending if it was daylight savings time or not. And, and I'd hear, Run! Adam! I'd go, oh, man. Where are you going? i got to go home and eat, man. I don't want to eat. You guys know what I'm talking about. We went home, and there was my brother and myself. My father was at the head of the table. My mother's on the other side. If we had any guests or visitors, they sat there too. And we ate dinner together every night. Most nights, right? It was every night. Just what a great habit to get back to. How many of you guys still do that? Still? Still do that? You guys do that? That's a great thing to get back to, isn't it? Now, wouldn't it be great now the man of the house gets up and goes, hey, you know what? Here's a piece of bread. Pass that around. Let's do a quick communion. Just to proclaim to God that we are communed together. We are one with each other and one with him. Bible says this is the body of God. This is the body of our Savior. Let's eat together. Let's take a bite together and just proclaim that we all one with God. Pick up your glass. Let's... Let's have a toast to the Lord. This is the blood of Christ. Let's proclaim his power upon us in his blood. What a great idea. Huh? Well, not, not a bad thing, huh? I mean, that seems like what the Lord did there, right? It's just an idea. Um, verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Very famous statement. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me thrice. Verse 31, but he spoke more vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all said likewise. Then they came to a place which was called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said with them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, stay here and watch. Please, this is where we're going to finish up. There's so much ground to cover, and, and you can cover the whole thing, but let's Let's let God's word speak for itself. What happens is Peter, in an understanding of things coming to an end, is going to, is going to try and proclaim that they're not going to happen the way the Lord says. They're only going to happen over his dead body. So Peter says, listen, even if I've got to die with you, I will never deny you. And, and, and the Lord says, you know, Peter, before this night, before the roaster crows this night, you will deny me twice that you, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Even if I got to die, I will never deny you. One of the things that, that Jim was talking about is that I like to proclaim, and this is 
the last thing I, I want you guys to know is there's a um, there's this crazy thing that goes on when the, when the church gathers together here. We feel strong, we feel good, we feel filled with the Spirit, and I want you guys to understand. Who you are when you are here is who you are created to be. Fill with the Spirit with the understanding that outside there is what you have to take from here, not there here. You don't bring out there into here. You bring here out there. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Peter said, listen, uh, the Lord said to Peter, you got this thing backwards, dude. Don't complain. Don't say what you're going to do. Just go and do it. But the truth of the matter is, the very thing that you feel like doing, you won't do. What is it? Romans chapter 7, I believe. That which I want to do, I don't do. That which I don't want to do, that what I want to do. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Abbreviated Bible study today, guys. I want to go through this chapter. Please be encouraged. That God is with us. God, each and every single minute of every single day, has got something for each and every single one of us. Be encouraged by the understanding. Oh, guys. That Christ's death that we're about to experience in the next couple of weeks has truly given us life. Are we living it? Are we living like it? Close your Bible, please. Perhaps there is somebody here that has never accepted Christ as their Savior. Perhaps there's a situation and a circumstance that has happened in your life that you don't understand why you're going through it. I want you to know that at any given time, you can open your heart to the Lord. I just want you to leave here knowing if life sucks right now, God is the God of unsuck. <laughs> Boy, my wife's going to get mad at me for that one later. <laughs> is she not here? She went in here? Oh, no, she is there. <laughs> uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. And we ask you, please, God, to do something in our lives. Prepare us to, uh, to bring this message out to a lost and hurting world. And we don't have any, any false pretenses or any false understanding. We know that we are foul and that we are filthy. And we proclaim to you, God, that we need you. God, we want to be filled with the confidence that Peter had to say, we'll never deny you, God, but I think after all these years, we know, unfortunately, it's going to happen again and again. So we ask you, please, Lord Jesus, just be with us. At every step along the way, as we take out of here, that we want to be filled with your spirit. And that in work and in our marriages, in our finances, in our health, you would be glorified. God, that you would show us the things that you have for us, God, help us, especially during this time in our country. Father, it's such an amazing time, amazing time, the things that you're doing. It certainly seems like you're about to send your angels to reap. God, I pray for anybody here that is unsure exactly what they're doing. May their heart experience something they've never experienced before, touch from your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, bless us as we go from here. May we carry your name. May we wear your name proudly and humbly. In Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you.